Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Sermon in the Barn. I'm excited today to bring to you God's Word this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I apologize it's for those that do watch. I appreciate it. I do apologize for being so uh, late in the week, uh, getting it here, uh, getting it to you. Um, I usually try to do it midweek, but um, uh, just pray for me. You know, anytime you do anything for the Lord, the devil always uh, tries to enter in, whether it be in your mind or or even in, in just everyday physical life, uh, he tries to, uh, to to stop it. And uh, you know, it's it, it's been a it's been a little bit of a battle this week to get this sermon prepared. Um, but I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. We're going to go on with it anyway. If you want, if you got your Bibles, I'd like you to be turning to. Uh, if you want to turn to Romans chapter seven, uh, we're going to be starting. Uh, the main scriptures are going to be uh, Romans chapter seven, verse fifteen through. I think we're going to read down to um, to verse twenty. So we're going to read five uh, five scriptures this morning and uh, and elaborate on those. Um, and while you're turning in your Bibles to Romans seven, starting with verse fifteen, I, again I just want to I just want to I can't stress enough the, the the people that watch you know and and uh, um, and um, you know and and watch this sermon in the barn. It means a lot to me. Not not only I'm not. Um, I'm not talking about as much as, as you watching, although I do appreciate you watching, but I'm mainly talking about it means a lot to me to be, be able to bring God's Word to you. You know, uh, and um, I think that's an honor, but it's also, a, a you know, a, a big shoe to step into. So you just got to be careful. You got to be prayered up and ready. And uh, I feel like today, uh, this is an exciting um, a lesson slash sermon uh, that I'm going to uh, give to you all, and I'm just excited, and I hope you have open minds, and I encourage you to read your Bible. I encourage you that when I when when you watch me or any other uh, preacher, I, I, I would I would uh, encourage you to get your Bible out and read um, a, and follow along. You know, uh, I love the pages of a book. I, I, I'm just old fashioned that way. Uh, I love flipping through these uh, these pages. I have a uh, I have an app iPad that I sometimes uh, you know, have tried to read, uh, God's word on, and I don't get it. I don't get, I don't like it as much. I ain't gonna say I don't get nothing out of it. Cause I do. Anytime you read God's word, you get, you get something out of it. But, um, but I just like a book. I don't know if anybody out there, uh, it, it can, can concur with me on that or not. But, but anyway, so I just encourage you to read along. Um, if you've, uh, if you found Romans seven chapter, um, chapter 15, uh, I want you to hold that mark there, but I want to read something to you out of instead of flipping. I just wrote it down instead of flipping through the Bible. I want to read. I want to read First uh, Corinthians um, six uh, verse eleven to you. And what Paul's talking about here, he's talking about us after we're saved, after we become saved, and we we uh, we uh, give our heart to the Lord. Um, he says, "And such were were some of you." And in, in the beginning of that verse uh, 11 right there, what he's talking about when he says, in such were some of you, well, you'll just have to go above that and read what he's talking about. But my main focus is what he says after that. He says, in such were one of you, were some of you, and that's talking about before conversion, before you gave your heart to the Lord. But now he says, but now you are washed, and I'm going to put this in parentheses, uh, by the blood of Jesus does that. Uh, you are washed, but you are sanctified. What sanctified means? That means to um, to be made perfect. That's your position in Christ. But don't get too don't get too big headed on that just yet. Uh, and then it says, but you are justified. What's justified means? It means to be declared guilty. Or excuse me, sorry, to be declared not guilty. And I do have a I do have a young filly in the barn that I just got in yesterday, so it might be a little noisy, and I apologize. But let's read that again. But you are washed by the blood of Jesus. You but you are sanctified. You're made perfect. That's your position in Christ. But you are justified. You're declared not guilty. So there you go. There there is someone that's saved. Now now let's let's go to uh, and praise God for that. I shouldn't have said that so quickly. Praise God for His blood that we're able to be saved. Praise God for that. I, I tell you, that just hit me like a like a ton of bricks just now. And um, so so after that, the, the the sanctification process starts. What is sanctification? That is your position in Christ when you're saved 
is perfect. In other words, the only way that God the Father can see you is if He sees His Son in you. So that, that to Him, He sees you as perfect. That's just your position. Now try to hear me out here. Um, that is not your condition by no means. If that was your condition is, is to be perfect, then you'd be Christ. And we all know that's not possible. And we would all also know that Christ never would have had to came and die if we were, you know, equivalent to him. So, so, but that's your position when you're, when you're declared uh, uh, sanctified by God. But that is not your condition. It is a lifelong process of, of being made uh, perfect. And, and really, we never really get there until we get our glorified bodies. And that's either if we go into rapture or if we die of a natural death. So now, with this process of sanctification going on, how does this work? How does it work? How does it start to work? If, well, if you'll turn to me to Matthew 3, I want to read you Matthew 3. Save your place in Romans, if you would. Let's turn over to Matthew 3, uh, chapter 11. Or excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. So um, Matthew uh, chapter 3. Verse 11. So what does it say in chapter, uh, or Matthew chapter 3, verse 11? It, who, who's speaking here? This is, uh, this is John the Baptist. And I just lost my place. Y'all just bear with me. The old devil's after me again today. So we'll just, uh, we'll just laugh at him and keep on going here. So Matthew 3, uh, verse 11. That is, um, that is John the Baptist introducing Christ. And how does he introduce Christ? Well, let's read it. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. That was what John the Baptist was called to do. But listen to what he says after this. Who comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, uh, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor <clears throat> and gather it his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chafe with unquenchable fire. All through this, it's speaking of the work of the Holy Spirit that you, that you have, uh, that is available to you by Jesus Christ and him coming to this earth and dying on the cross. He says it right here. Let's talk about this little quickly because I've got a lot to go over. Let's talk about this whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly, thoroughly purge you, purge his floor and gather his wheat into his into the garner. That was an old um, that was an old process of harvesting wheat back then. What they would do is is they would they would run something heavy across that wheat, eat, whether it be a team of oxen or a, or a wagon wheel or something. But they would break that they would break that seed out of that husk out of that out of that wheat, and and that would stay on the floor. That's the good stuff. That's, that's you. That, that's where you need to be, I should say. That's what God's trying to get from you is that goodness, that, that, um, that, that person that he's trying to make you. Uh, all the other stuff they would throw away, all this junk that's in us. And, and when it says his fan is in his hand, what they would do is they would, they would take a, a, a homemade like fork type device, like a, like a hay fork or something, and they would throw that weed up in the air, and, and they would take a big palm leaf fan of some sort, and they would fan it, and it would blow all the all the all the chafe, chafe all the chafe away. And then when it says um, uh, he will burn up his chafe with unquenchable fire, um, that's that's what the Holy Spirit does inside of us. He burns all the bad out of us. How does he do that? Well, he does that through through uh, through con conviction. You know, he does that through chastisement. Uh, don't watch that. Don't say that. Don't do this. Don't go there. Don't hang out with them people anymore. Uh, not that you don't love them people, but they're they're different than you now. The uh, the the, un, the unbelievers. They're they you don't have anything in common with them anymore. Not to say you don't witness to them. Not to say you give you give give up on them. But that's a whole another sermon right there. But that's not what he means. But 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 when you feel those things inside of you, that's the Holy Spirit trying his best to clean you up, like they did this chafe. So so now, if you would, let's turn back to. I got excited there and lost my page. If you would, let's turn back to Romans now. Uh, this is Paul uh, giving this epistle, epistle and uh, Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Um, he, he is a saved man here. Now, now a lot of people in, in the past have believed that this, 
have preached and taught that this is not talking to believers, but it is. Paul is a saved man. If, if you go in order of this, he's already been saved. He's already been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And uh, he is saved here. And he's speaking of himself. Uh, and, and, and it says, um, now, now before I tell you what the Scripture says, or before we read along with it, uh, let me give you a quick uh, image of what happens. And this is the whole point of today's sermon. Uh, we get saved and we're on fire for, for Jesus. We should be. We're excited. We're brand new in the Lord. Uh, we're wanting to do everything we can to please Him. That should be all of us. And if you're truly saved, it will be you. And then all of a sudden, we fail. You know, I don't know how long it will be after you're saved, but it's a guarantee. Now, I know a lot of people think that uh, once you're saved, you're just totally perfect. Well, I hate to tell you, you're not. And, and I hate to tell you, but, you know, without Christ being in you, you can't fight this stuff off by yourself. But I'm getting on into my sermon here a little bit. Let's stick to, let's stick to, um, let's stick to what we're talking about here. You're saved. You're on fire. Uh, you're trying your best to live for the Lord. And all of a sudden, you fail. And it bothers you, and rightly so. It should just jerk your heart out. It should make you feel like you're just, a, you're, you know, just awful because you failed the Lord. And, um, you know, and no telling what that failure may be, but, but, but regardless, it would be a sin, whatever it was or is. And, and some of this stuff, it, it stays with you. Now, a lot of people preach that, that when you get saved, that, uh, that you don't, that you're not chastised by sin anymore, or you're not tempted by things, or if you've had a really strong bondage of some sort, of uh, uh, an addiction, and that addiction can go for, for drugs, alcohol, pornography, um, uh, the list goes on and on. Gossip, um, uh, temper. Um, if that if that was a stronghold that, that Satan had on your life before you got saved, it may not leave event, you know, immediately. Um, and that's not giving you a license to sin. Paul will talk about this further in this in this in this subject today. That's not a license to sin, but those things do not leave you immediately. So so when. So when those things come back after you're saved and you, and you slip up and you fail and you give in to that, um, what do we do after that? That's, that's today's subject. What to do after that? What do we do? We start thinking of things of ourselves that we can do. We start saying, well, we need to read our Bible more. We need to go to church more. We need to pray more. We need to witness more. We need to somehow make this up to God. Now, all of them things are true and right, and you should do them. I'm not... I don't, would not want anybody to ever think that I'm saying not to pray, not to go to church, not to read your Bible, not to witness to people, I, or not to mow the church lawn. I'm not saying to do that. But we, we as humans feel like that we have to do something to earn a merit with God. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot earn your forgiveness. It was bought and played, paid for over 2,000 years ago on a bloody cross. And, and by Christ, by Jesus Christ, praise God for that. It was bought and paid for. When he said it is finished, he meant it is finished. And we're to go to him constantly when we fail. So let's read what Paul says here a little bit. He's talking about this sanctification process that I'm talking about that we go through after we're saved right here. And in verse 15, he says, For that which I do, he's talking about the failure. Let's break this down as we go. For that which I do, the failure, I allow not. What does he mean when he says, I allow not? Well, that word allow means understand. In, 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 in the translation, in the Greek translation, that's what this means, that word allow. So let's read it like that. I'm not trying to change the words of the Bible. I'm just trying to help y'all understand it better. It says, for that which I do, which is the failure that he's done, something in his life, he's got something that's, that's, that's sticking with him. For that which I do, the failure, I understand not. The Bible says, I allow not. But that word means I understand. I don't understand, in other words, why I keep doing this failure. So let's go on. It says, for what, for what I would, that do I not. For in other words, what he's saying here is, is he's talking about he, he wants to be obedient to Christ. He wants to do what's right. And, and, he, says, and he says, for what I, I would, that do I not. And, and in a sense, it means that we're, the believer is married to Christ, but being unfaithful to Christ by spiritually cohabiting with the law. What law? I'm not really talking about the law of Moses necessarily as the laws that we make up in, within, in ourselves. 
Uh, we make up laws within ourselves. Read more. Uh, go to church more. Um, so forth and so on. And again, anybody that's out there that thinks I'm preaching against them things, I'm not. Trust me. I'm talking about we make that a law. So, so anyway, uh, and then it goes on to say, or, or, my, con or my, my little notes here says, that means the Holy Spirit will not help such a person which guarantees failure. He can't help you. And we'll get into that here in just a minute. The Holy Spirit can't help you when you place your faith outside of the finished work of Jesus Christ. He cannot help you. He don't leave you, thank God, but he cannot help you. So Paul goes on to say, but what I hate, that do I. He hates what he's doing. In other words, you hate what you're doing, whoever's out there. But you, you don't understand how to quit. You don't understand. You're trying to do it on your own. And, and, and I'm going to help you today make you realize that you can't do it on your own. And I'm trying to make this as short as I can. But what I hate, that do I. It says, if then I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that is good. In other words, what he's saying is, if I if I do that, I consent unto the law. The law, it, it simply means that the law of God is working as it's supposed to. It defines sin. So he's consenting to the law by recognizing that he's not doing right. That's all the law was meant to do, was, was be a mirror of what we really are, and that's sinners. Uh, now you might say, well, I'm saved. Well, Still, you're, you're born a sinner. And that's what the law is supposed to do is show us our sins. And then it goes on to say in verse 17, Now then, it is no more that, excuse me, no, now then, it is no more I that do it. It says, but sin that dwells in me. There's one thing I meant to tell you about this. When Paul speaks of sin in, the, in these epistles, in the, in the original Greek, uh, it had the, the definite article before sin. What is the defi def definite article? The definite article is the word the. What he's talking about right here is the sin nature. So when you read this epistle, if you would, uh, if you would, would, would just say to yourself, when you see sin, let's do it right here. It says, now then it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. You can say, but the sin nature that dwells in me. What is the sin nature? Well, it's what was uh, uh, made be in us by the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. If you don't think that we're born with a sin nature, and I heard a man make this analogy one time. It's kind of humorous, but I like it. He said, put two, two babies in a crib, two kids in a crib, and throw a toy in there, just one toy, and watch what happens. Mine, mine, mine. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. So, so don't tell me that we're not born with a sin nature. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's what he's talking about here is the sin nature. He's not necessarily talking about acts of sin. When I say acts of sin, I mean actually like the, like, uh, uh, adultery or, or, and all them things are bad. Don't, don't think I'm saying that they're, they're not. But what I'm saying is he's talking about that sin nature that keeps arising in us. Uh, you know, it should become dormant after we're saved. It's still there. It never leaves. There's always that, that sin nature way down in us that has, should become dormant. But sometimes uh, the devil will find a crack and he'll get in and he'll trigger that. Well, what do we do after that? Well, let's just read on right here. Uh, but, 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 but the sin nature that dwells in me. In verse 18 it says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good. He's talking about the real person, who you are. The dwells no good. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. What he's talking about right there is, is your willpower. We can't fight the powers of the enemy off with our own willpower. We can't do it, folks. There's no way. It's too strong. You can wake up every day and you can say, um, that sin that I committed yesterday... And, and, and I just want to speak to the holier than thou's out there real quick. If, if, if you're sitting there saying, well, this sermon's not for me. I'm a born again Christian. I don't sin. Then you better be careful because you're saying you're Christ and we can never be Christ. So, so when you wake up every day, I don't care how strong or how much you say to yourself, I within myself am not going to do that today. Well, you're setting yourself up for failure already. Because you can't fight it off, my friend, my brother and sister. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit. And how can He work? 
properly, we're going to get into that. So it goes on to say, for to will is present with me, with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And then he goes on to say in, in, um, in, uh, in verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. And that is, if you depend on self and not the finished work of Christ. What I'm preaching to you today is the message of the cross. It's the new covenant. It is laying it all to the side and saying nothing in this world can help me. Nothing in this world can help me but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what I'm trying to get over to you today. Your, your denomination can't help you. I'm not saying that you can't go there and get uh, guidance. I, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is if you place your faith in anything other than Christ and the finished work that He did on Calvary's cross, the Holy Spirit has to stop. He has to stop. He don't leave us. God, God, thank God He don't leave us. But He can't help us the way He wants to. So let's go on. For the good that I, that I would, I, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. How many out there, how many out there can, can relate to this? I know I can. I think we all can if we just be, break it down and be honest to ourselves. And in verse 20 it says, Now if I do that, I would not. In other words, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Let's change that. Not change it, but let's let's let's, let's read it the way that the original the re, the original Greek says it. It says, "Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but the sin nature that dwells in me. Why? 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 Why is the sin nature popping up?" Why is the sin? I'm, and I'm preaching to myself, folks. I'm sitting here looking at myself on this, on this camera right here, on this, on this cell phone, and I'm, I'm talking to myself. And I know others out there is going to see it, but I just want to let you know, I'm not pointing any fingers. I am not pointing any fingers. I'm preaching to myself. Why does this failure keep popping up? Why? Because our faith and our focus and, and, and all that is, is incorrect. That's why. And, and I have something here that I want to share with you that, I, that I, I wanted to share with you today that I learned. First, I'm going to show you the bad side of it, if that's, if that's okay, if it's okay to use that terminology. Um, I'm going to show you. I want everybody to read this right here. This right here says, Let's look at this. I'm trying to get it just right here. Defeated Christian life. Why are you having a defeated Christian life? Where is your focus? Works. What is works? All them things I just mentioned. That's where your focus is at. All them things are good. Please don't get me wrong. All them things are good. But that is not where your focus needs to be. And then you got object of faith. When you have a defeated Christian life, your object of faith is more than likely performance. Your performance. What you do. What you can do. Your, your, your how you do it. Your intellect. Your, not, your, your worldly knowledge. Your, you can have a, in other words, you can have a, um, well, I won't get into all that. I'll offend somebody, but, uh, and that's okay. We'll offend, them. We'll, we'll offend them another day, but I don't want to get into that. But your performance, when, you're, when your object of your faith is your performance, and your focus is on works, and your power source is self. Whew. Boy, this right here, that's something, ain't it? When your power source is self, what he say, I will to do good, but I can't find it in me, then the results is failure. Did I say you're going to hell in a handbasket? No. But God wants us to have victory. That song, Victory in Jesus. Oh boy, that's my that's my favorite song. Victory in Jesus. He wants us to have that victory. It's been preached before, but you only get victory when you when you when you get when you go to heaven. You can have victory on this earth over the world, the flesh, and the devil. You can. Now let's look at let's look at a victorious Christian life. This is exciting, folks. 
Let's look at a victorious Christian life. Right here we go. A victorious Christian life. Where should your focus be? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. On the man. The man. Jesus Christ. He excites me, y'all. Just saying that name. I could run around this barn and praise him. And if I lay this down and take off, then I'll be right back. But I could just say his name and I get excited. Jesus Christ. That ought to send shivers down your spine. And your object of your faith should be the cross. I don't mean the, the wooden beam that he was hung on. That'd be silly. I mean the finished work that was on that cross, that was, that was accomplished on that cross. When he said that it is finished, and we're all able to benefit from these things now, from this keeping our faith anchored in that power source, Holy Spirit. What did I say a while ago when I was talking about the Holy Spirit has to back away. He can't help you. When you get out of your, when your focus gets off of Jesus Christ and your object of your faith is, is in something else other than the cross, the Holy Spirit can't work with that. He works in the confines, in the box, so to speak, of the finished work of Christ. That's the only place that He can work. This is exciting, y'all. I'm on the edge of my chair. I didn't mean to get so close to y'all, but um, I'm just excited. Um, and and, and, and he, he can't work with anything else. When our faith is outside, and that's where, that's where the devil creeps in. But if we've always got our power source plugged in, that Holy Spirit, which is God, man, what do we get? Results. Victory. Hallelujah. Victory. That's what I'm saying. Let's look at this again. Let's look at this defeated Christian life. Again, focus. Works. Object of faith. Performance, power source, self, results, failure. Let's plug in that. Let's plug it in now. That's unplugged. The yellow's unplugged. Let's plug in. When your focus gets on Jesus Christ and the object of your faith is on the cross, the finished work that He did there on that cross, and your power source is always relying and listening to and, and, and walking after the Spirit. You know, in verse in, in chapter 8 of Romans, it says, Now, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. That's what that means. In other words, yielding to the Holy Spirit. What does yield mean? It means when you yield on a highway, what do you do? You allow someone to go ahead of you. You yield to that car or that vehicle. It's the same thing. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, He is your power source then. How do you yield to the Holy Spirit? By listening to Him. It's simple. And then if your faith is in, if your focus is on Jesus Christ and the object of your faith, if faith is the cross, then when you yield to the Holy Spirit, He can help you more and more and more. And then you, your results become victory. This is awesome, y'all. I hope that... Um, I hope you enjoyed it today. I encourage you to read the book of uh, Romans chapter 6 and 7, all of, all of the Bible. I encourage you to read all of it. But I just want to read to you my favorite scripture real quick. And it has everything to do with what we just talked about. This is, this is if I was to, if you were to ask me my favorite scripture, it would be Galatians 2, scriptures, it's 2, Galatians 2, verse 20 and 21. And it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's powerful. I'm going to read that again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Ain't that awesome? And then it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain. Ain't that awesome? Paul says in verse in 1 Corinthians 1 and 23, he said, but we preach Christ crucified. He goes on to say in, 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 in chapter 2, verse 2, for I, am, for I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Y'all, the waters are stirring. I invite you to get in. The waters are stirring of the, of the Holy Spirit today. 
And I, and, I, and I encourage you, if you're out there and, and you're a believer and you feel like that you have got off your path, so to speak, and you feel like that you're waking up every day to failure, that you just feel like you're, you're, you're giving in to the, to the wiles of the enemy, I encourage you to hit your knees and tell Jesus, first of all, I'm sorry for getting my focus off of you. I'm sorry for the object of my faith being in something else. And, and I ask you for, your, for, for that power source of the Holy Spirit to come and help me because I want the results of victory. I encourage you today to do that. I love you, you all. I hope that you uh, uh, got something from this. I know it, it speaks to me in magnitude every time I read it and study it. And um, again, comments are welcome. I encourage you to, uh, to read your Bible. I encourage you to stay in God's Word. He said we shall not live by bread alone. But every word that proceedeth, proceedeth out of the mouth of God or words to that effect. In other words, uh, that is our spiritual food, is the Bible. You know, there's too many Bibles, like the old song or something says, that's got dust on them. Get that Bible out. Pray to God before you read it. God, help me discern the words of this, of this great book. Help me understand what you're trying to tell me. And I encourage you to get a commentary Bible. Again, um, I don't get paid for this. I wouldn't take it if they tried. But um, I encourage you to get Jimmy Swaggart's uh, commentary Bible. It, it has helped me so much. Uh, you can go online to jsm.org. That's jimmyswaggartministries.org. And um, you can go to shop JSM. And um, it'll pull all these Bibles up. There's several editions. They're King James versions. Everybody thinks, oh my, he changed it. He didn't change nothing. It's King James Version. Um, his scripture, if some of you hadn't seen it, the scripture hasn't been changed. The scripture's in black, and his commentary is in, it is in red, and it's right around the scripture. It's very easy to follow. I thank God for it. I think it was Holy Spirit uh, um, ordained, uh, anointed to do, and uh, I encourage you to get a good commentary Bible that can help you any, any time that we can learn more and in more clarity the Word of God. Uh, it's a great thing. You can have a stack of papers that high with, with PhDs and college educations. But if you don't know, if you don't know this Bible, and I don't mean to be a Bible scholar, I, I'm not, but if you don't know God's word and his prescribed order to salvation and victory and sanctification and all that that we can have because of Christ's finished work on the cross, then we you don't know anything. I know that's blunt and to the point, but it's the truth. You don't, you're ignorant to life if you don't know anything about his prescribed order. So get you a good Bible. Read it. I hope this, I want to go over this one more time with you. Let's look at the, and you may think I'm running into the ground, but it's worth running into the ground. Let's look at the defeated Christian life. Focus is on works. The object of your faith is on your performance. And your power source is yourself. And that, the results of that is failure. Let's look at, let's look at this glorious one here this victorious christian life focus is on jesus christ object of faith is the cross what he did thereon, the finished work power source is your is the holy spirit which is god and the results is victory this is awesome y'all it's been good to, it's been good to have church with you today i appreciate you watching send me comments not i don't want, I, i'm not asking for comments on good job and i appreciate that don't get me wrong but that's not the, I mean, but send me comments on how this has helped you and how, you know, it just encourages me. You know, the old devil gets in my ear and says that I'm wasting everybody's time and it's a big joke. But, um, uh, but I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. But it's good to encourage people. And I encourage you to encourage people. Encourage your pastor. Encourage your church. You know, so, and I need that as well. So anyway, I, I, I love you. I appreciate you. And God bless you.